Let me introduce now Vittorio Gallese. Trained as a neuroscientist, he is professor of psychobiology and cognitive neuroscience at the Department of Medicine and Surgery of University of Parma, Italy. His research focuses on the relationship between the sensory motor system and cognition by investigating the neurobiological and bodily grounding of intersubjectivity, psychopathology, language, and aesthetics. He is the author of more than 300 scientific publications and three books. Um, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening. Um, it's a great pleasure being here. I, I, I would like to uh, thank uh, Museo Castello di Rivoli and uh, its director. Uh, Caroline Christoph Bacher here for uh, the invitation to um, take part to this uh, digital marathon on uh, um, digital PTSD. Uh, this afternoon, I want to cover the, the topic of the potential traumatic effects uh, of um, digital media on, um, on people. Um, I would like to focus briefly on a, a more basic phenomenon. Um, how do we uh, look at images? How do we embody images? And um, if we need to add something special when uh, the images we are dealing with are uh, digital ones. So this is basically what I would like to very concisely uh, cover in the next 20 minutes or so. Vision and the brain, how do we embody images and uh, introducing a, a potential mechanism that uh, explain how our brain body uh, enable us to experience uh, uh, a variety of, uh, of images uh, we may be um, um, relating to. Then, um, a big change in our relationship with images introduced by what I uh, half jokingly define uh, the skin screen, portable digital uh, screen, and uh, uh, the new performative quality of vision that is introduced by means of this uh, technology. And if I make it, I, I will uh, uh, briefly uh, summarize the results of. Uh, a recent experiment that we carried out uh, in, in, in tight partnership uh, with uh, a digital artist, uh, Ori Gerst. Okay, so how do we see the world? Uh, uh, normally, as a neuroscientist, I would say that uh, there is a specialized part of our brain, the so-called visual brain, that enable us to build uh, a visual uh, a map uh, of the world and of ourselves within it. Um, this is uh, uh, certainly true, but it's uh, just a partial truth. Uh, the fact is that uh, in order to see the world, we should, um, and we actually uh, employ uh, a much bigger network of brain resources. So uh, if you allow me uh, the expression, what I would like to do is to challenge uh, the so-called visual brain imperialism, namely the idea that in order to see, you need to activate uh, the visual brain. In order to feel touch, you need to activate uh, the tactile part of the brain. In order to move, uh, you need to activate the motor part of the brain. Things are more uh, blended, uh, more uh, integrated, uh, um, in a word, more complex. Why we should uh, uh, take a stance against the primacy of the visual brain uh, in aesthetics? Here, by aesthetics, I refer uh, to aesthetics. Uh, I mean, um, the way to um, learn about the world through the bodily senses. So I'm not specifically referring uh, to the perception of particular object that we now designate as artistic object. Observing the world is far more complex than the mere activation of the so-called visual brain. Why? 
because vision is multimodal. It encompasses the activation of a variety of brain circuits, including motor, somatosensory, and emotion-related uh, brain networks. And um, when we think about uh, um, the motor part of the brain, the motor system, we tend to think uh, of it as a, a, a kind of neural machinery whose only uh, purpose is to set our body parts into motion. This, of course, is true, but the motor system does a lot more than that. It may happen that uh, uh, our cortical motor system, the, the motor neurons in our brain are full, fully active, but we don't move. So what's the purpose of this activation of the motor system uh, um, when we do not move, not to produce movement? The purpose is to provide a glue uh, that enable us to integrate a variety of multisensory uh, information about the world and integrate them uh, within a coherent bodily-centered uh, experience. Our brain body expresses the range of potential relationship with the world that lead to the establishment of a relational self, modeling and delimiting the horizon of the world in which we live. So in other words, the motor potentialities expressed by our body, even when we are totally still, as I'm uh, and in, in this very uh, precise moment, sitting, uh, looking at you uh, through uh, my webcam. Well, uh, in spite of the absence of movement, the motor potentialities that uh, uh, my motor system express greatly contribute in uh, designing uh, uh, my umwelt. Uh, the part of the world where I uh, perform, uh, where I meet others, when I meet uh, uh, physical objects. In other words, we know and understand our world, our umwelt, by virtue of the relation of potentialities that are instantiated by our body, which in turn shape and model the brain's sensory motor schemes. Um, in the last 30 years, we uh, gather um, a lot of uh, information about the functionality of this uh, frontoparietal uh, um, a motor network. And the purpose of these brain networks is to integrate information, not only, as I said, to control action, but also to serve the function of building an integrated bodily mapping of actions, of the objects uh, we relate to, and of the location to which our actions are directed, particularly the space surrounding our, our body, what we call very personal space. So the bodily contingencies which are posed by the specific configuration of the human body, which is the way it is because it had to adapt to a very specific uh, environment, our world, not only constrain our behavior, we can jump, we can walk, we can dance, but we can't fly, but also constrains what neural mechanisms in our brain can map. And uh, I propose uh, uh, a model of perception and imagination, which is based on this uh, new way of functioning of our brain that has been discovered in the last 20 years or so, namely reuse. We use parts of our brain for a variety of, of purposes. Uh, we use parts of our brain to experience emotion, sensation, to perform uh, in the world, but we may reuse those very same brain networks also to map the emotion, the sensations, and the actions of others. So in a way, uh, this mechanism unifies both verbal and nonverbal aspects of our interpersonal relations. It reveals a, a, a unified functional mechanism which connects physical reality with imaginary fictional worlds because when I imagine to move, part of the same brain areas that normally guide my moving behavior are also active in spite 
of the fact that my body is still. So we have uh, the possibility to link at the functional level uh, symbol making and symbol reception. That would be a long, uh, a long talk. I have no time uh, um, to delve into this. But um, uh, the beauty of, of this mechanism is that it's very parsimonious, but enable um, to uh, bind together a variety of aspects uh, of our experience of the world, particularly so uh, uh, now as we speak, uh, we always created parallel words, we always created images, we always narrated stories. The particularity of uh, the new parallel world, which is uh, made possible by digital technologies, the media scape uh, we are all uh, uh, a part of uh, uh, at this very precise moment introduces uh, um, new forms of relations with others and with the world. The evolution of the reproduction of digital images has allowed the miniaturization of screens. Since 207, uh, objects like this have uh, dramatically uh, changed our social practices. In sport, a substantial portion of our visual world has uh, literally been sucked, like this beautiful image of Antoine Geiger shows, under the surface of a multiplicity of portable screen, what I designate uh, as uh, the skin screen. Why skin? Because uh, we have touch uh, screens uh, for the first time at our disposal, to hand, so to speak. So uh, the smartphone, uh, the, the skin screen becomes a techno body uh, prosthesis. So what's new? Well, what's new? Uh, a few things. The proxemics of vision, which occurs predominantly um, within peripersonal space, which is the space uh, culturally governed by the laws of proxemics. So people in different parts of the world tolerate different distances from the, the people they are dealing with. It's uh, uh, a, a part of the space surrounding our body dynamically glued to our performing body, which is also a very specific emotional connotation. Uh, is a space that we defend from uh, others' potential intrusion, particularly as we speak uh, in the pandemic. So I don't think that uh, um, this type of vision within this specific speciality uh, um, has no role in modulating uh, our experience of the images we are beholding within these distances. And we are actually uh, uh, trying to investigate the impact of the distance uh, uh, on a variety of, of things that go on uh, in the brain and in the body of beholders. Second, we have uh, a performative quality of vision. Touching the screen is uh, fundamental uh, in order to uh, play the images, to uh, shrink them, enlarge them. It's a constant dance uh, of our finger on the surface of the, of the screen that just because of this performative uh, practice uh, is never entirely transparent, but periodically becomes opaque. It becomes the target of, of, of an action which in turn uh, uh, turns on uh, a new uh, um, um, uh, visual experience. So the intermittent opaque quality of the screen is something that uh, introduces uh, um, uh, a different uh, uh, mediation, uh, which most likely uh, um, will have an impact that we want to know more about. Uh, I don't have data yet. Uh, uh, and um, if I'm um, allowed to say so, I think too few people, uh, uh, as we speak, are uh, in empirically investigating uh, uh, this uh, fundamental dimension of, of, of our time. So let me conclude by telling you something uh, of what we did with Ori Guest. Um, Ori Guest collaborated with us from the very beginning of this project. Uh, uh, he produced the images uh, that we used uh, as stimuli. Uh, digital images uh, that came uh, into uh, a format. Uh, the whole image or uh, an enlarged detail uh, 
high, uh, the highest uh, resolution possible or very low uh, resolution. So these were the two uh, orthogonal dimensions that uh, we studied, and we wanted to, to uh, learn more how playing with this uh, uh, um, uh, quality of digital artistic images uh, may have an impact uh, on uh, the experience of beholding. So the original artworks were selected and manipulated by Ori himself. And we were testing five behavioral parameters, how people found uh, uh, beautiful, how much they liked uh, the digital images, how much uh, they wanted to touch them, how uh, uh, spatially close they felt uh, to the image, how much movement uh, they could detect in these still digital images. And uh, we varied the images, as I said, along two dimensions, resolution, high or low, and magnitude, full image and detail. So these are um, uh, examples of the full images uh, or uh, of the detail uh, that comes from digital work uh, uh, of Origer. Participants were shown 32 digital artworks, each repeated six times, and for each repetition, the image was associated with a different question because we wanted uh, people to experience the image alternatively in a different mindset, uh, looking for specific qualities uh, of the uh, digital image that could be different uh, at each repetition. How much do you like it? How beautiful do you think it is? How much do you want to touch it? How close to you is the image? How much movement do you perceive in the image? And a control question, how bright is the image? So a very simple experimental paradigm, the instruction, a fixation cross, the image on the screen for 10 seconds, and then how much do you like it, how much do you want to touch it, etc. cetera. Uh, the two types of manipulation of the original images, resolution, high and low, magnitude, full, opus, or detail, had different effects on participants' ratings in the different experimental conditions. High resolution images got the higher scores than the low resolution ones. For all questions, interesting but one, the one related to movement. So people tended to see more movement in low resolution images than in the high ones. The observation of the original works of art by Origes um, apparently established a bodily relationship between the holders and the aesthetic and haptic properties of the digital images themselves. Furthermore, high resolution images obtain higher scores than low resolution ones in terms of the desire to touch the images. So we interpret this uh, in the following way. The more visual information you have uh, pertaining to texture, color, materiality, uh, the more that enhances your sensory engagement and therefore the, the, the uh, experience of presence uh, that we make of those very same images. Comparing the two magnitude, detailed images, the zoomed images, obtain higher scores for the proximity question. So the large image was felt as being closer to beholders than the full one, uh, indicating that participants perceive the detail as closer to their body. And this could be interpreted as a zoom effect, which amplifies the sense of closeness between the image and the participants' bodies. By means of enlargement, the body experience of digital works of art uh, appears to be enhanced. And we also found uh, interesting correlation between the how beautiful, how much do you like, and uh, the tactile, the haptic dimension of the digital image. Beauty ratings were positively correlated both with touch and light score, which seems to uh, empirically establish a clear relationship between the sense of presence, observer's body involvement, and the aesthetic judgment about the content of those uh, digital items. So these results, although preliminary, uh, they support the role of embodiment, and in particular of embodied simulation in digital art observation, highlighting its role 
during aesthetic experience. I am almost done. Digital images are the locus of virtual interaction, which constitutes a sophisticated form of mediated intersubjectivity when we deal uh, with others uh, through digital mediation. These elements are connected to the function of embodied simulation and the ways through which beholders connect to images, uh, to put it differently from the way uh, Carol would put it, are not just offline mental processes, but primarily online bodily forms of engagement. The bodily engagement implied by this mechanism constitutes a useful starting point to analyze the mode of presence that characterizes the digital mediascape and to shed new light on our responses to it. So what I'm proposing is that neuroscience could be and should be actively engaged in the understanding of the ways in which the body interface with the material world and with the parallel digitized one, revealing some of the rules of the game which provides tools eventually to design new context and new mediation. This is a moving field, it's a field in progress. I think we know still too little. We should uh, um, know a lot more about digital disintermediation. Neuroscience can provide uh, uh, some tools uh, to accomplish that. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Vittorio Gallese. Thank you for being with us in the second part of our digital PTSD. Um, now, just to wrap up your intervention. We just presented digital visions. Neuroscience and physiology today can investigate the brain-body mechanisms enabling our interactions with man-made images, shedding light on the functional mechanisms enabling their perceptual experience. Vision is a process far more complex than the activation of the visual brain. Our visual experience of images is the outcome of multimodal integration processes in which the motor system is one key player. In his talk, Vittorio Gallese just briefly discussed this new model of vision, emphasizing that the multimodal integration of what we perceive is triggered by the potentiality for action that we express corporally. He just argued that the digital revolution has shifted the balance toward an ever-growing exposure to digital images and introduced a novel performative quality to our perceptual experience of them. Some implications of our digital visions are just being discussed. 